الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين وأصلي وأسلم على أفضل خلق الله أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اتبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد So before beginning with uh, the session on Al-Qawaid al the exemplary foundations concerning the names and attributes of Allah, we just wanted to remind everyone again that um, inshallah we are expecting Abu Hakim to arrive um, by tomorrow morning. Um, as well, inshallah we've confirmed a telelink with Sheikh Muhammad Bazmul to take place at 10 a.m. tomorrow. After Maghrib, inshallah Sheikh Fawzi will be starting the first dars, the benefits from the book clarification that the Ahl al-Hadith are the saved sect and victorious group. And uh, inshallah, we're uh, working on confirming a telelink with Sheikh Rabi throughout the duration of this conference. So inshallah, the brother will be beginning with the dars from Al-Qawaid Al-Muthla. Faliyat al-Fadl. In alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa sayyati a'malina man yahdihillahu falamudillalah wa man yudlil falahadiyalah. وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله Somebody keep track of time because I don't have a watch يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَيْكُمْ رَقِيبًا يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَقُولُوا قَوْلًا سَدِيدًا يُصْلِحْ لَكُمْ أَعْمَالَكُمْ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَمَنْ يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها فإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار. After beginning, أما بعد after beginning by praising Allah سبحانه وتعالى and reciting the خطبة الحاجة which is well known to all of you that which our Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to recite to his Sahaba on the different occasions throughout uh, the years of his messengership that which uh, has been singled out with تأليف has been singled out by a, a book about its chains and its fadl and its virtues by the Shaykh, uh, the Imam, the Mujaddid Muhammad Nasruddin al-Albani. After saying that khutbat al haja uh, we begin, inshallah, our first session from a number of sessions that we will have, inshallah ta'ala, in the book, Al-Qawa'id al-Musra, fi sifat Allahi ta'ala wa asma'ihi al-Husna. And the book by uh, the Shaykh, Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Salih al Uthaymin, Rahmatullahi alayhi. It's a very exemplary book, just like its title. It is a book which is an example of excellent authorship, an example of a master of aqidah bringing forth his ideas and bringing forth his, uh, his style of teaching in the book form in a way that benefits, in a way that will benefit not only the Arab audience that read the book in Arabic, but those who read it in the languages that it becomes translated into like our language of English, that we have been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have this book uh, in our language. Our shaykh in, in Mecca, the, the shaykh uh, Abu Usama, shaykh Wasi Allah ibn Abbas, who teaches at the Haram uh, and has a chair there and teaches five or six days a week. Our shaykh was t- talking about uh, the books that are much needed by the English audience or much needed by the Muslims in general, books of Aqidah. And he mentioned that in his opinion, the most the book we are in most need of in today, today in this, di- in this time, in this day and time, in, a f- in regarding Allah's names and attributes is the book Al-Qawa'id Al-Musra Fi Sifat Allahi Wa Asma'ihi Al-Husna. This book that we are, inshallah, about to begin our study of. So the book has a very high manzala. And in the beginning of the book, there is mention of the praise of the Allama, the Shaykh Al-Islam, Ibn Baz, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And what he said about the book and his praise for the author, and his praise for the book itself, and his mention of what the book includes, and how the book is excellent in its virtues and in its, uh, in its contents. And the uh, Shaykh Ibn Baz, rahimahullah ta'ala, made uh, an excellent dua for the author of the book and for those who read the book. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to extend his mercy upon both of the two shaykhs, 
both of the two imams, both the lights of guidance from the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, both of those who were from the great ulama of this century, both of those who aided in the spread of a tawheed all, across all corners of the earth. We ask Allah to increase His mercy for them and to extend it and envelop them with His uh, divine mercy. And we ask Him by all of His names and attributes to do that. Um, the first principle we're going to look at today, inshallah, after understanding that the book is divided into a number of se sections. The first section of the book are, is seven, seven principles concerning the names of Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala. Seven principles. And inshallah, each principle, inshallah, after reading it and discussing it with evidences, will be clear and understood, inshallah ta'ala. And if you were to memorize one evidence, one ayah, or one hadith to go along with each principle, you will have done yourself a great service and you will become, insha'Allah ta'ala, a resource for the people in your area when it comes to asma and sifat, the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With these principles that you will gain by the book of the Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al uthaymin you will be able to clearly distinguish between the kalam of Ahlul Bid'ah and the names of Allah Azza wa Jal and how they talk about the names of Allah and the kalam of Ahlul Sunnah. And you'll be able, once you have these principles, to be able to judge each kalam, each sentence that comes to you and, and know which of the two parties, uh, from which of the two parties has that speech come from. The first principle that we're going to discuss from the seven principles uh, of Allah's names, and secondly after that will be the principles of Allah's attributes, and then we'll have the principles of the, the evidences that are related to them, and then we'll give some examples of how we apply these things, how we apply these principles, and then also we're going to look at the Ash'ariya creed in, in detail. We're going to examine the creed of the Ash'aris. We're going to look at a little bit of the life of Abu al-Hassan al-Ash'ari himself, rahimahullah ta'ala. And we're going to see how, what's their position? Are they kuffar? Are they Muslims who are sinners? What's our position with them in light of the different jama'at? And we're going to see where their errors are and how they are refuted and how the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the way of the early imams uh, is strictly against them. As for today, or right now, the sitting that we're doing, it's going to be just about the first seven principles mentioned in the book, the first seven principles about the names of Allah, ta'ala, and they begin on page 15, page 15 of the uh, English version that is being sold in the, in the hallway. And I would advise you, if you haven't picked up a copy of the book, to get a copy of the book, it will assist you in the study of the, of the book, and it will benefit you uh, more, many more times over than just listening without the book. As the book is, of course, as we mentioned, a book on a level, on such a high level that it deserves a serious study, not just a casual you know, attendance to a conference or something, but this book deserves a serious study. And if you were to increase upon what you gain here in the conference, and if you were to cooperate with the people of your area, inshallah, many of you are representatives of your area, or people who hold positions in your area, and you were to organize with the people in your area to come together on a certain day and to read certain pages from the book, if you have no one of knowledge to teach you, and give yourself a test from the information from the book, from the evidences, from the, from the principles, you would, do yourself, you would do yourselves quite well in helping each other to understand the principles of Ahl sunnah when it comes to the names and attributes of Allah. The first principle concerning Allah's names uh, is that all of Allah's names are beautiful. So when we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a name, it's not like so-and-so has a name. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a name. When we say He is Ar-Rahman, Allah has that name, and that name in includes the utmost limit, or the outer limit of Ar-Rahma, of mercy and beauty in each and every name. And the Shaykh firstly mentioned the ayat of Allah Azza wa Jal from Surah Al-A'raf, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى And verily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the most beautiful names. And he says that is because they include perfect attributes and have no defects in them in any way whatsoever. From the aqeed of Ahl Sunnah is that we negate from Allah Azza wa Jal, we deny and reject anyone who says that an attribute or a name of Allah Azza wa Jal has a defect or it's deficient in any way whatsoever. So each name that comes to us from the Book of Allah or from the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we affirm it in its complete and perfect understanding. So no one could possibly assume a defect from them, nor could they nor could they outright claim that there is a defect in them, as the Shaykh says. He says an example of that is Al-Hayy, Al-Hayy, meaning the ever-living, the one who, the possessor of life, Al-Hayy. Al-Hayy is the name of Allah Azza wa Jal, and it includes the attribute of perfect life. The life 
for example, that is not preceded by death. A life that is not followed by death. That is not preceded by absence, afwan. And it's not uh, followed up by death. This life necessitates other attributes that are perfect as well. Like knowledge, capability, hearing, sight, and others. Another example is that Al-Alim, uh, one of Allah's names is Al-Alim. Al-Alim. It's one of His names that denotes perfect knowledge. Not preceded by ignorance, nor followed by forgetfulness. Allah is Al-Alim with a complete and perfect encompassing knowledge that is not preceded by ignorance nor followed up by forgetfulness. About it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, عِلْمُهَا عِنْدَ رَبِّي فِي كِتَابٍ لَا يَضِلُّ رَبِّي وَلَا يَنْسَى And knowledge of it is with my Lord in a book. My Lord is not unaware nor does He forget. And that's from Surah Al-Taha. So the knowledge referred to when we say that Allah is Al-Alim is a comprehensive knowledge. It encompasses everything, generally and specifically. And whether it's related to his own actions, or it's related to the actions of his creation, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows well what he has done and what he will do. And Allah azza wa jal knows well what his angels do, and Allah knows well what his messengers have done, and Allah knows well what every single servant that he has created has done, is doing, and will do. This is the complete knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّا هُوْ And he, verily he has, or in, and he has the uh, keys to the unseen, and no one knows them except him. وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ And he knows what is, in, what is on land and what is at sea. وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا وَلَا حَبَّةٍ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْأَرْضِ وَلَا رَطْبٍ وَلَا يَابِسٍ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ And he knows what's on land and at sea. And not a single leaf falls except that he knows of it. Not a grain in the darkness of earth, nor anything fresh or dried, except that it's in a clear book. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is explained. The name Al-Alim is explained by these number of ayat. And similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْلِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا وَيَعْلَمُ مُسْتَقَرَّهَا وَمُسْتَوْدَعَهَا كُلٌّ فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ Allah Taala has said, and there is no creature that walks the earth, uh, except that Allah upon Allah is to give that creature its provisions. And Allah knows its temporary and permanent storage place, where it stays and where it stays temporarily and where it will stay permanently. And all of that is in a book, in a clear book with Allah Azza wa Jal. And furthermore, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says about His ilm that is understood, His knowledge that is understood from His name Al Alim. يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَيَعْلَمُ مَا تُسِرُّونَ وَمَا تُعْلِنُونَ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ الصُّدُورِ He knows what is in the heavens and the earth, and He knows what you hide, and He knows what you do openly. And He knows what is within the chests of men. And He knows what is in, within the chests. Another example of a name that denotes perfection in the attribute that is understood from it is the name Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahman is the name of Allah Azza wa Jal. And as well, it includes the perfect attribute of rahmah, the perfect attribute of mercy. About it, about it the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam exemplified or sh- struck an example of the mercy of Allah azza wa jal one day when some war captives were being brought forth in front of the companions. And so one of the ladies from the women war captives couldn't find her son. And so she was very frantic, trying to find her son, running about here and there. And she was very upset. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, Would you imagine, would any of you imagine, this woman, well actually they saw firstly that she had found her son, and became very happy, and put the child to her breast, and, and walked away with the child, being, being happy and relieved that she had found her son. So he said to them, wasallam, Would any of you imagine a woman like this, taking her son and just throwing him in the fire? And so they said, yeah, no, Rasulullah, we would not ever imagine a woman like that doing that. So then he said, لَاللَّهُ أَرْحَمُ بِعِبَادِهِ مِنْ هَذِهِ بِوَرْدِهَا He said, then verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the la, the lamb here in front of the, the Allah is lam maftuha, لَاللَّهُ Verily Allah, and it's for tawkeed. Verily Allah is more, more merciful with his servants than this lady is with her child, than this, this lady is with her boy. And that hadith is found in Al-Bukhari and Muslim. So this hadith shows clearly that the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal is more expansive than any parent to her mother, any, any mother to her child, or any father to his son, or any, 
any man to his child, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is more encompassing and more complete and more perfect than that mercy. And about it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ And my mercy has encompassed everything. And he said about the supplications of the angels for the believers, he has mentioned that the angels make supplications for the believers saying, رَبَّنَا وَسِعْتَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ رَحْمَةً وَعِلْمًا O our Lord, verily you have encompassed all things by way of your mercy and your knowledge. So there we have also a reference to the other attribute of knowledge coming from the name Al-Alim. So therefore we see clearly that the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not merely a name, but the name entails a great meaning. The name entails a great, a great kind of perfection, a perfection that has no equal to it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from our aqidah has no equal. Has no one even similar to Allah, there is no one even similar to Allah azza wa jal. And that goes for each and every one of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and the meanings associated with His names. Furthermore, the perfection that Allah possesses through His beautiful and lofty names, it can be exemplified with a kind of perfection on top of perfection. And that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala combines two names and mention, mentions them together in His book. Like how He mentions frequently in the Qur'an, Al-Aziz Al-Hakim, wa huwa Al-Aziz Al-Hakim. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that He is Al-Aziz Al-Hakim, it shows that He is Al-Aziz, the possessor of might and the possessor of honor, and He is Al-Hakim, the possessor of wisdom, the possessor of hikmah. So then, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the possessor of might and honor, He is not one who uses that might and honor to oppress the people. Rather, He is Aziz and Hakim. He uses that might and that honor for wisdom and for things that have, for all purposes that, that denote wisdom. And you will never find Allah azza wa jal using His might and His honor to oppress people. Whereas within the creation, you find people who are mighty and powerful use their attribute of izza. They use that attribute of honor and power or might and they use it to oppress the people. They use it for wrongdoing. They use it for evil. But you will not find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing that because His name Al-Aziz comes in the Qur'an with Al-Hakim. That means every time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uses His uh, might, it's in a way that is with hikmah and it's bound by His hikmah. And it does not exit from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then when you combine the two names together, you have this kind of complementing, one, one name complements the other, and it makes a form of perfection, which is perfection on top of perfection. For verily, Al-Aziz by itself, a name of Allah Azza wa Jal denotes the most perfect kind of Izzah, the most perfect kind of might and honor. And the name Al-Hakim by itself means that Allah wa ta'ala has the most perfect wisdom. And the most, he is the most wise of anyone. And so when you combine them together, you have a kind of perfection on top of perfection. وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ hakim And likewise, as the Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al-Uthaymeen has said, the judgment and wisdom of Allah is coupled with perfect might and honor, contrary to the judgment and wisdom of the creation, as they are often subject to disgrace and humiliation. Hmm. So when a person has hikmah in the dunya, a person has hikmah, he can be a person who has hikmah, but he's a bum. But he's someone who has no status with the people. He's a person who has hikmah, but he doesn't have any status with the people. He doesn't have any izzah. Whereas Allah he's the person, he, he is al-hakim, the possessor of hikmah, and he is the possessor of al-izzah and might and honor. Moving on to the second principle. The second principle of the first seven principles that we're looking at tonight, that is the principle that they, the names of Allah Azza wa Jal are both titles and descriptions. Meaning they are both names and descriptions. As we mentioned when we talked about in the first principle, the names of Allah are beautiful. All of them are beautiful and none, none of them have any deficiency. We talked a lot about the meaning of the name and the attribute associated with the name. So that leads us to our second point here, that the name of Allah Azza wa Jal, مَثَلًا Rahman. It's not simply a name that refers to Allah, our Creator. Rather, it is a name that refers to Allah, our Creator, and it is a name that refers to His attribute. And it's a name that describes our Creator. So now we have uh, Al-Alim, it's referring to Allah. And Al-Alim refers to Allah with His attribute of perfect knowledge. And 
for example, he says al hay this, is, this will help us to separate our aqidah from the aqidah of the Mu'tazila. Because the aqidah, the Mu'tazila say that Allah is al-alim with no ilm. Allah is al-alim but he has no knowledge. And Allah is al-sami' and he has no hearing. Allah is the all-hearing with no hearing. And Allah is al-basir, the all-seeing with no sight. The kalam of the Mu'tazila is indeed strange. And the end result of their kalam is that Allah has no names, Allah has no attributes, they in fact worship nothing in their aqidah. So to separate our aqidah from the aqidah of the Mu'tazila, we apply this second principle. So we see that Al-Hay is Allah Azza wa Jal. Al-Alim is Allah Azza wa Jal. The ever-living and the all-knowing. Al-Qadir, the all-capable, that's Allah Azza wa Jal. We're on page 19. Al-Rahim, or Al-Sami' and Al-Alim, the all-hearing and the all-seeing. They're referring to Allah Azza wa Jal. Al-Hakim, Al-Aziz, all of these names refer to Allah Azza wa Jal. But as the Shaykh says, the meaning of Al-Hay is not the meaning of Al-Alim. The meaning of Al-Hay is the all-living. And the meaning of Al-Alim is the all-knowing. And so they are referring both of them to Allah Azza wa Jal, meaning that the name is the name of Allah. Both of them are equal in the fact that they are names of Allah. But both of them are different. They are different when it comes to their meanings and what they, what they necessitate from the meanings. So we say that they are both titles, as the shaykh says, and descriptions since the Qur'an has indicated this. As found in the statements of Allah, Azza wa Jal, and the author here, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he goes on to bring some ayat that prove without, without a shadow of a doubt that the madhab of the Mu'tazila is batil. That indeed Allah Azza wa Jal has more than one name. And indeed these names that he has, they, they denote different meanings. They don't all mean the same thing. And we don't say that Ar-Rahim means the same thing as as samiyah That's the bottom line. When you say Ar-Rahim, it means, ar- it means the one who possesses mercy, but he doesn't have mercy. Ar-Rahim bila rahma. Al-Alim bila ilm. as samiyah bila sami'a. They, mean, they, they intend by this to say that these are simply names and they have no meaning. For if you were to say that they have a meaning, for example, if you were to say that as samiyah means the one who hears, then you would make Allah like the creation because the creation hears. This is their thinking behind their uh, rejected aqidah. We reject that based on the ayat from the Qur'an because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed us, وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ And He is الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen to inform us of two of His names here. It would be sufficient if the names did not mean anything different for Allah to say, وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ And to leave it like that. But Allah from His hikmah has said, وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ And has mentioned two names. So the two names must have a difference. The two, the two names must carry two distinct meanings. However, they both refer to Allah Azza wa Jal. Also, Allah has said, وَرَبُّكَ الْغَفُورُ ذُو الرَّحْمَةِ And your Lord is الْغَفُورُ ذُو الرَّحْمَةِ Here is the explanation of the first ayat. In, here, in this ayat, the Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al-Uthaymeen, he explains the first ayat that says, وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ He is oft forgiving and merciful. He explains it with the following verse, And your Lord is Al-Ghafuru Dhu Rahma, the possessor of Ar-Rahma. Look at the two ayats there on the page 19. You see in Arabic, for those of you who can understand the Arabic a little bit, وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ The two names of Allah, Al-Ghafuru Ar-Rahimu. Then look at the ayat after it. It says, Al-Ghafuru Dhu Ar-Rahma. Al-Ghafur, the oft forgiving, and Dhu Rahma. Dhu means the possessor of something. Dhu, Dhu Rahma. So Dhu Rahma, the meaning of it is what's found in the first ayat, Ar-Rahim. The meaning of Ar-Rahim is Dhu Rahma, as found in the second verse. So here he is clarifying, the, the Imam Muhammad ibn Salat al-Uthaymeen, clarifying that the name Ar-Rahim has a meaning. How did he get the fact that Ar-Rahim indeed has a meaning and there's no way around it? By bringing another ayat that begins the same way with Al-Ghafuru Dhu Rahma, Dhu Rahma, saying that Allah is Al-Ghafur Dhu Rahma. He is the possessor of the attribute of mercy. And that is understood from the first ayat, Ar-Rahim. He goes on to re- further refute the aqidah of the Mu'tazila, saying the people of the Arabic language, meaning the scholars of the Arabic language, and customs, meaning of Arabic customary use of the language, they agree that one may not be called alim unless he has knowledge. We don't say that 
so-and-so is alim, unless we are referring to an attribute of knowledge. And we don't say that so-and-so is sami' unless we are talking about that attribute of hearing. And we don't say that so-and-so is rahim unless we are trying to inform you that he has mercy. So then how can it be referred, how can Allah tabarak wa ta'ala be referred to with these names without having intended the attribute associated with the linguistic meaning of the word? He says, this is an affair that is too evident to be in need of a proof. Of course, who is going to accept from people of intellect? Who is going to accept that I say so-and-so is samir, so-and-so is all hearing, a person who has, he- has hearing, but he has no hearing? No one's going to accept that from me. It's a statement of frivolity. It's a statement of idiocy. However, it's the aqidah of the mu'tazila. So based on this, he says, the straying of those who, neg- who negate the specific meanings of the names of Allah the Exalted becomes known. Such are the people of ta'wil. I'm sorry, ta- ta'atil. Such are the people of outright denial. Those who, when the verse comes to them, verily Allah is al ghafur rahim they just deny it. Allah is not al ghafur and Allah is not al rahim They make ta'atil. They just negate it. They drop it out. Of, they just drop it immediately without trying to explain it away. They say, Allah the Exalted is a samir without hearing, al-basir without sight, and al-aziz without might, and so on. And that is the aqidah of who? The mu'tazila, na'am. And they have attempted to justify this, as the shaykh explains, saying that to affirm multiple attributes necessitates affirming multiple deities. What he means to say here is, that if you say Allah is a samir and al-alim, that means you have now two deities. You have a samir and al-alim. It's a very childish thought, it's a very childish aqidah, a very simple and foolish aqidah for you to say that everything or, or Allah Azza wa Jal has one name and one description. And if you were to add a second one, you make, it, you make Allah Azza wa Jal into two separate deities. For if we were to take the simplest of created things like this glass here, we can give it a number of attributes. We can say it's light, we can say it's empty, we can say it's made of glass, we can say it's round, we can say it's... We can add a number of things. So if a glass, a simple glass, can have a number of attributes, why do we say about Allah Azza wa Jal that He has only one attribute and whoever adds to it has made Allah into a number of deities? It's foolishness. And this is what the Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al-Uthaymin has explained here. This is a sick justification, as he explains. Rather, it is a dead one due to the textual, the textual and intellectual evidences that prove its futility. Here you're going to notice that the Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al-Uthaymin brings out his fiqh brings out his good understanding of the religion. Whenever he wants to refute the opponent, he brings textual uh, and intellectual evidences as well as sometimes instinctual evidences, evidence that don't really require intellect, evidences that anybody who still has a a hint of their fitra that they were born upon can understand. And as well he brings qiyas and different kinds of evidences, but the menhaj of his book is that the fiqh of the book the aqidah that's presented in the book is based upon textual and, into, and intellectual evidences. And he puts forth, puts forth the textual evidences first. And the textual evidences will come from the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the intellectual evidences will also come from the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he'll bring statements of the early scholars and then he'll bring uh, arguments that no one can deny based on their, their clean intellect. So the first textual evidence, he says is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who's described himself with many descriptions while at the same time maintaining that he is uniquely one. That he is al-ahad and al-samad. Allah the Exalted has said, إِنَّ بَطْشَ رَبِّكَ لَشَدِيدٌ إِنَّهُ هُوَ يُبَدِئُ وَيُعِيدٌ وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الْوَدُودُ ذُو الْعَرْشِ الْمَجِيدُ فَعَالٌ لِمَا يُرِيدُ Verily the batsh, the striking of your Lord is severe. Verily he, he is... Verily, it is he who begins and repeats. These are all attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. And he adds some names. وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الْوَدُودُ ذُو الْعَرْشِ الْمَجِيدُ فَعَالٌ لِمَا يُرِيدُ And he is the all-forgiving, the loving, the owner of the throne, the majestic one, the one who freely does whatever he wants. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also said in Surah Al-A'la, سَبِّحِ اسْمَ رَبِّكَ الْأَعْلَى الَّذِي خَلَقَ فَالسَّوَّى وَالَّذِي قَدَّرَ فَهَدَى وَالَّذِي أَخْرَجَ أَخْرَجَ الْمَرْعَى فَجَعَلَهُ غُثَاءً أَحْوَى Glorify the name of your Lord the Most High, Al-A'la, one of Allah's names. 
And then there also is Arab, Rabbika, Sabbihisma Rabbika al A'la. There we have two names, Arab and Al A'la. Alladhi Khalaqa Fasawa, the one who created and the one who proportioned everything. Walladhi Qaddara Fahada, the one who has given measure and then guided. Walladhi Akhraj al Mar'a, the one who brings out the pasturage and then makes it into dark stubble. Fajaluhu Gutha and Ahwa from the opening verses of Surah Al A'la. So all of these ayat they show you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a number of descriptions. A number of names and a number of descriptions. And this does not necessitate in any way, shape or fashion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be divided into a number of deities or that to have a number of descriptions like this necessitates that it's a number of deities that we are talking about. That's his textual evidence. As for his intellectual evidence, he says the attributes themselves are not separate from the one being described. So this does not necessitate affirming multiple deities. They are just attributes of the one described with them. So they are not separate from him. It is inevitable that everything in existence must have multiple attributes. That's similar to what I mentioned to you about the cup. And, and mention any dunya thing, the tiniest, most smallest thing. And it's going to have more than one attribute, no matter what it is. And we were in class in the university studying this book. And a student says, Sheikh, I have, I can mention something that has only one attribute. And it's small. And so he said, the atom, the atom, the smallest thing that, that is, that is, that's in creation that the people know of, the atom. So the teacher asked him, does the atom speak? He said, no. So the teacher said, then it's silent. It has the attribute of silence. He said, is it red? He said, no. Well, what color is it? It doesn't have a color. He said, then it's not colored. It's non-colored. So he went on to, to ask him questions about that small thing. Huh? You said it's small, add that one, it's small. Hmm? Can you see it? No, it's too small to see, but it's invisible. How many attributes will you keep going until you find that even the smallest thing that you would think, has, it's not deserving of even an attribute. You can list the number of attributes, and the more you think about it, the more attributes you come up with down the line. So he says here, that it is inevitable that everything in existence must, must have multiple attributes. Is it moving or is it still? It's still, or the atom, they say it's moving in some kind of direction. So that's another attribute. So it has the attribute of existence, and it exists. So there's the attribute of existence. Add that to the list. And it can be described by being either something that must exist, or something that may or may not exist. And here he separates the creator from the creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what's called wajib al-wujud. There's no way you, that Allah can possibly not exist. As for us, we can come, our existence will come to an end. As for the rug, as for anything else, it may or may not exist. So it has that attribute of being something that may exist or may not exist. Furthermore, as he explains, each thing that exists can either be something independent or something related to something else. Be something directly related to something else. The button that exists on my thobe is directly related to my thobe. Or it can be something independent that has nothing to do with anything else. So based on this principle, and this is the intellectual argument. And you see that his intellectual argument is not philosophy. His intellectual argument is not based on rhetoric or any type of straying from the book and the sunnah. Rather, the true intellectual argument in the deen is that which coincides with the book and the sunnah, and that which supports and aids the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Messenger So based upon this principle, he says, that Allah's names are both titles and descriptions, it becomes known that ad-dahr, ad-dahr is not one of the names of Allah Azza wa Jal. And this, here we have another example of mushkil al-hadith, a hadith that it's apparent and outer Meaning seems to contradict the book of Allah Azza wa Jalla, or seems to contradict the principles that we have established in the deen. Or verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or has inspired his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to say, Qala Allahu Ta'ala, Qala Allahu Azza wa Jal. I'm skipping ahead to the bottom of the page there. Uh Ibn Adam, Yasub Dahra, wa ana dahru biyadil amru uqalibu layla wa nahar. Here's the mushkila. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in the hadith Qudsi that Ibn Adam insults me and tries to harm me by insulting the time, Ad-Dahr. Ad-Dahr is the name of Surah Ad-Dahr. Hal ata ala al-insani hinun min Ad-Dahr. Has it come to mankind a time from Ad-Dahr? A, 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 a time, a part of time. Ad-Dahr is the night and the day, what we call time. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa ana Ad-Dahr. And I am Ad-Dahr. So he says, I am a dahr This is Allah Azza wa Jal saying, I am a dahr بِيَدِ الْأَمْرُ أُقَلِّبُ الْلَيْلَ وَالنَّهَارِ So is the shaykh, the shaykh, his conclusion here, and this is the conclusion of Ahl sunnah as well, that Ad-Dahr, Ad-Dahr is not one of the names of Allah Azza wa Jal. Why is that when Allah says, وَأَنَ الدَّهْرِ 
We're going to see, inshallah, from the explanation of the shaykh here. He says, so this does not mean that a dahr time, is from the names of Allah. That is because those who curse time only intend to curse the frame of events. They do not intend to curse Allah the Exalted. So the meaning of his statement, and I am the dahr, is explained by his statement, the affair is in my hand, I alternate the day and the night. And a dahr, uqallibu al wa nahar. I am a dahr, and I alternate the night and the day. Here we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifying the beginning of his statement with the end of his statement. The first part of the Hadith Qudsi is explained by the latter part of the Hadith Qudsi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of time and whatever it contains. And he clarified that he turns and alternates the day and the night and they are the time. So it is not possible that the one who alternates is also the one being alternated. So if a dahr the time, is day and night, then Allah is not a dahr because Allah is turning the day and the night. So Allah is not turning his own self. Allah is turning the creation that he has created, the dharf, what we call the envelope or the, the, thing which, the thing which contains the day and the night, that which is called time. He is the one who turns it and alternates it. So therefore, he cannot be the one being alternated as well. So his statement, an dahr is explained by what comes after it. Allah's own statement that he is the one who alternates the day and the night. So based on this, he says, it, it becomes clear that it is impossible for Ad-Dahr in this hadith to be referring to Allah Azza wa Jal as one of his names. No. He mentioned earlier as well that it cannot be, uh, the name Ad-Dahr cannot be referring to Allah as one of his names because firstly it is a word that has no relative description or action related to it. This goes back to our first principle. That all of Allah's names are beautiful and they have beautiful meanings. So if we say that I'm Abd al-Dahr, my name is the servant of al-Dahr, and Allah's name is al-Dahr, and it's from his beautiful names and attributes, what beautiful and complete description have we given Allah with that name? What is the beautiful and complete description that comes from the name al-Dahr? There is none. And in fact, there is no verb related to the word al-Dahr. There's no dahra yadharu. There's no verb that comes from the word al-Dahr. Ad-Dahr is not mushtaq. So then there's no beautiful description that would come from the word Ad-Dahr. So then it's not from the descriptions that we describe Allah tabarak wa ta'ala with, except that we say Allah's Ad-Dahr meaning He alternates the day and the night. Naam. And that's the end of the second principle. The second principle was that Allah's names, uh, each one of them are both titles and descriptions. They are both a title and a description. So by this, Ad-Dahr cannot be the name of Allah. Because why? What's the description that Allah is described with by way of a dahr? You're calling Allah time. Then what's, his, what's the description? It's not from the names of Allah Azza wa Jal. And the hadith has been explained by Allah Himself, Tabarak wa Ta'ala. And there you have the explanation of that mushkil al hadith, that uh, hadith which is an apparent uh, difficult thing to understand, apparently uh, something hard to explain. The third principle concerning Allah's names, as is on page 23, is that they may or may not include a related ruling or implication. They may or may not related an ex- they may not include an external, let's add that, an external ruling and implication. Okay? The implication of, for example, uh, as he mentions, Al-Hay. Al-Hay is the name of Allah Azza wa Jal. But Al-Hay has no verb and it has no transitive uh, meaning, meaning it has no verb that causes, it, causes the one who has that description to act on something else. For example, we need to understand some Arabic to understand this. So I'm going to go into a few minutes of an Arabic lesson, inshallah ta'ala. We have the word jalasa, jalasa, jalasa zaydun. When we say jalasa zaydun, we can never, we can never, we say zayd sat. We can never have a direct object for this verb. We can never say jalasa zaydun al kursi. We can never have a direct object, not in English or Arabic. Actually, we have to say zayd sat on the on the chair. We have to say zayd sat with a, a prepositional phrase after that. We can't have a direct object in English or Arabic. However, uh, zayd made zayd made something. Now we have to have a direct object. So let's consider that in terms of our discussion here: transitive and intransitive. Transitive is that which takes a direct object. Zayd hit his brother. Zayd hit, we need something after that. Zayd hit, who did Zayd hit? Daraba Zaydun Akhahu. Zayd hit his brother. 
So that's called transitive. That's a verb that's transitive. The second kind of verb is that which is not transitive. We call it lazim in Arabic. Lazim and muta'addi. Lazim means zayd, jalasa zayd. There's no direct object and there never will be one. The sentence, the sentence is complete. So here we have with the names of Allah Azza wa Jal, we can apply this to some of the names of Allah Azza wa Jal. So when we say Allah is al hay, Allah is al hay, we have no verb that we can bring from it that has an external effect. It doesn't affect the creation. Allah is al hay, and there's nothing externally coming from that. As for saying that Allah is ar Rahman, it denotes that since Allah is ar Rahman, there's an external effect. There's an effect happening from that. Allah has Rahmah, and the Rahmah is extended to His creation. Rahimallahu as Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al Uthaymeen. May Allah have mercy. And then we have a direct object on Muhammad Salih al Uthaymeen. Huh? So there we have a transitive description of Allah Azza wa Jal. That He is Ar Rahim and Ar Rahman. And there you see how it's related to uh, His creation. And as for the name Al Hay, then it's not externally related to his creation. It has no external related ruling or implication. Let's see what the shaykh says and try to understand the principle better based on the words of the shaykh. Uh, if the name refers to a transitive description, and there's a footnote there if you need to check that out, if you haven't understood what I've said so far about transitive and non-transitive, then it includes three things. If it can take a direct object and it's transitive, then it includes three things. It's an established name of Allah Azza wa Jal, firstly. Ar-Rahman, it's the name of Allah. Before we know the meaning or anything, it's Allah Azza wa Jal. Ar-Rahman is referring to our Lord. Secondly, it's an established attribute that is included in the meaning of the name. Ar-Rahman is our Lord. And if we go into the meaning, the, the meaning necessitates that there's rahmah, that there's mercy. And Allah Azza wa Jal is the possessor of mercy because of His name, Ar-Rahman. And thirdly, since it's based on a verb that has a direct object, then Allah's mercy extends to His creation. That's the implied ruling, that's the related ruling that comes from that name. So let's look. Due to this, the people of knowledge have said that the highway robbers who repent may be exempted from punishment, using as proof the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, talking about them. He says, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ تَابُوا مِنْ قَبَلِ أَنْ تَقْدِرُوا عَلَيْهِمْ فَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Except those who make repentance before you get before you take them as captive or before you arrest them, then know that verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghafoorun rahim. Allah is the possessor of maghfira and rahmah. Allah is forgiving and merciful. And that is from Surah Al-Ma'idah. And so the shaykh says, this is because the related ruling and implication of these two names is that Allah the Exalted has forgiven them of their sins and bestowed mercy upon them by canceling the Islamic punishment from them. So here you have, by, men- by Allah's mention of those two names at the end of the ayat, we understand that there is an external effect that has happened there. That since Allah has mentioned after the ruling, after excluding them from a punishment, He said, فَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Then have knowledge that Allah is the possessor of forgiveness and the possessor of mercy. Then we assume from that that Allah has forgiven them and had mercy on them. That there has been an external effect that has taken place by as the result of Allah mentioning that name of His in that place. So that's the meaning of this uh, third principle, is that a name may include an external ruling or it may not. An illustration, another illustration of this principle is the name as samiya as samiya the all-hearing. It is firstly, go, go down our checklist here, it's referring to Allah Azza wa Jal. as samiya that's our Lord. Before I know any Arabic or what it means or even delve into the meaning, it's as samiya is my Lord, Azza wa Jal, that's my Lord. as samiya if we look into the meaning, He's all hearing. He's all hearing. He has the attribute of perfect and complete hearing. Then thirdly, we say there is an established ruling here because the verb that it comes from, samiya, has a direct object that it takes. So then we understand that there's an external ruling, an implication that comes from Allah having that name as samiya and that is what can be found in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's statement, وَاللَّهُ يَسْمَعُ تَحَاوُرُكُمَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَمِيعٌ بَصِيرٌ Verily, Allah has heard your two, the conversation of the two of you. And verily, Allah is, is uh, all-hearing and all-seeing. So, the fact that Allah is as samiya means there is no statement that we can say except that Allah hears it. No matter how quiet we make our statements, no matter how secret we make our statements, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not miss any of our statements. So, 
we understand from Allah having a sami, the name as Al-Alim, uh, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, that they, those attributes and descriptions that we understand from that name can be applied to His creation. All of them have an external effect, have an effect that reaches us. So then he says, to summarize, and if the name refers to a non-transitive description, then it includes only two things. That is, the name that does not include an, uh, an external ruling. That is, it includes only that it is the name of Allah. For example, Al-Hay. Al-Hay is the name of Allah. That's my Lord, Allah Azza wa Jal. He is Al-Hay. Secondly, Al-Hay is the possessor of complete and perfect life. That's my Lord who, who possesses the attribute of complete and perfect life. And I have no third thing to add. I have no related ruling or implication that is a result of Allah having that name. And he gives the example that I mentioned there of Al-Hay. So that's the third principle. In review, the first principle, all of Allah's names are beautiful. All of them denote beautiful and perfect meanings with no deficiency whatsoever. Secondly, the names are both titles and descriptions. They are not only names that refer to Allah Azza wa Jal, but they also refer to descriptions and attributes that are related to that name. And thirdly, our third principle was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names, names may or may not include a related external ruling or implication. Hmm? Fourthly, the fourth principle that we have to understand about Allah's names and attributes is a difficult one and we're going to um, have to understand some more Arabic. I'm going to have to give you another three minute Arabic lesson. We have mutabaqa, tadammun and iltizam. And insha'Allah ta'ala, say to yourself, I'm going to understand these three words and what they mean in relation to aqeedah, the aqeedah of asma wa sifat. At-tadammun, al-mutabaqa, and al-iltizam. We have these three words. And, I, and they are placed here in Arabic, so you can also learn the meaning of the word in Arabic, so you can uh, have a better understanding of the chapter. The names of Allah, as the shaykh says, they refer to His presence and His attributes by way of three methods of understanding them. Firstly, by way of mutabaqa, it's a direct and all-inclusive application of the name. Meaning, Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahman is my Lord. He's the most merciful. He's the one whose mercy reaches us. All of those things, I'm just referring to Allah Azza wa Jalla and everything all together. Al-Mutabaqa. Referring to everything. Then when we go to Tadammun, when I say bit Tadammun, by way of Tadammun, Allah has mercy. Ar-Rahman has mercy. I'm referring to one of those one of those parts that, that we've discussed in the first part. I'm either referring to Allah, just Allah without, any, without referring to any of His attributes or anything, by way of tadammun. Allah, that's, that's His name, that's His title. Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, without looking at the attributes. By tadammun, when I say Ar-Rahman, I'm talking about Allah. And by tadammun, when I say Ar-Rahman, I'm talking about separately, the possessor of mercy. Separately, not together. And when I say Ar-Rahman, I'm separately talking about the one whose mercy reaches us and the one whose mercy encompasses those who he loves and wants to reward. That's the meaning of tadammun. So tadammun is very much similar to mutabaqa. Mutabaqa is an all-inclusive application of the name. Ar-Rahman and everything that's related to it. When you say Ar-Rahman by uh, mutabaqa, that means you're applying every single thing that we know about the word Ar-Rahman. By tadammun means that we are referring to one of those things and not the others. And iltizam is referring to the necessary and logical conclusion based on the meaning of the name. The necessary and logical conclusion based on the meaning of the name. We're going to look at an illustration of that uh, from our Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al-Uthaymin. To illustrate this, he says, the name of Allah al-Khaliq refers to both Allah's presence and His attribute of creating together by way of mutabaqa. The name al-Khaliq, the creator, it refers to Allah's presence Himself. We say in Arabic, that that Allah, it refers to Allah's personal presence without, having, without talking about any attributes or what it means or what's the related ruling. So it, 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 um, it refers to Allah, the, the Khaliq, the Creator, by way of mutabaqa, all of that together. And by way of tadammun, it refers to Allah only. Or it refers to His attribute of creation. Huh? That's by way of a tadammun. And by way of iltizam, it refers to his two attributes of knowledge and capability. How is that? If I say Allah is al-Khaliq, doesn't someone who creates something have to have knowledge and capability? Can, can someone be a creator who doesn't have any knowledge? Can someone be a creator who has no capabilities? No. So then, from the name al-Khaliq, 
we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has knowledge and capability. And that's the meaning of iltizam. And we need to focus on iltizam as our shaykh shows us how al-iltizam is such a useful tool, tool for people when they look at the text of the book and the sunnah to imply rulings and to gain the fiqh of the book and the sunnah by way of saying, for example, al-khaliq means that Allah is al-qadir and al-alim. How is that? Because no creator, there exists no creator, no one who creates anything, no one who makes anything, except that he has knowledge and he has ability. So therefore Allah Azza wa Jalla, if He's the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything in them, then obviously from that name He has knowledge and ability. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, based on this iltizam that we're talking about here, Allah mentions the creation of the heavens and the earth, and then He follows it up. By saying, لِتَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ أَحَاطَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عِلْمًا And so that you will know. Here's Allah mentioning the creation of the heavens and the earth. And then He says, mentioning this, so that you know that Allah is over everything with power. And that Allah has surely encompassed everything by way of His knowledge. From Surah Al-Talaq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the reason why He mentioned the heavens and the earth and their creation. And he says, so that you would know that Allah is above everything with power. And so that you would know that Allah has encompassed everything by way of his knowledge. So there is the relationship of al-khalq, the creation, and that Allah has the attribute of perfect creation. So that you would know that Allah is above everything with power, and he encompasses everything by way of his knowledge. So there you have the relationship by way of iltizam between the khalq, the creation of Allah, and his knowledge and his power. So he says, the shaykh, rahimahullah ta'ala, so iltizam is something very beneficial for the student of knowledge to understand. When he ponders over the meaning of something and Allah grants him the ability to make good logical conclusions, then by this he is able to apply one piece of evidence to a great number of different masail in the religion, a great number of different issues. And you must know, he goes on, that a necessary conclusion from one of the statements of Allah azza wa jal or from one of the statements of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if it is truly a necessary and logical conclusion, meaning if it's truly logical and necessary, you have, this is a direct result of saying that, then it is the truth. This is because the speech of Allah and his messenger is the truth, and a necessary conclusion based upon the truth must also be the truth. So when I say that when Allah has called himself al-khaliq, I understand from that, that he has to have power and he has to have knowledge. He has to have abilities, he has to have power and he has to have knowledge. I understand all of that from the word khaliq. And that's a direct conclusion from what, he, what Allah has told us that he is al-khaliq. So when I understand that, since that's a logical and necessary conclusion from someone, if anyone is a khaliq, anyone creates something, he has to have knowledge, capability and power, or else he wouldn't be able to create. So since that's the case, that's a necessary and logical conclusion. So then it's also... What it's also included in the intended meaning of Allah's name, Al-Khaliq. It's considered to be included in the meaning of Al-Khaliq. That's the meaning of Iltizam, that it is included in the name Al-Khaliq by way of Iltizam. And then the Shaykh, he goes on to mention a side issue about the speech of other than Allah and the speech of other than his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we're going to leave that since it is not directly related to the chapter that we're talking about, and it doesn't have any direct impact on the principle itself relating to Allah's name. Okay, the fifth principle, we'll take it because it's a short principle, and we'll wrap up with the fifth principle now. The fifth principle of Allah's beautiful names. He says that the names of Allah are tawqifiyah. The names of Allah Azza wa Jal are tawqifiyah. And there is no place for intellectual free thinking regarding them. Meaning that Allah's names are not established except by the revelation. You can't come up and think of because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful and because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator and you can't come up with a new name. As for descriptions, you may be able to understand some, some conclusions from what he has said, but you cannot make a name for Allah azza wa jal except with a text from the book of Allah and from the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is due to Allah's statement, وَلَا تَقْفُ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ and do not chase after, and do not follow after that which you have no knowledge of. And do not follow that which you have no knowledge of, or verily the hearing, the sight, and the chest. You will be questioned about each of them. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala furthermore has said, قُلْ إِنَّمَا حَرَّمَ رَبِّيَ الْفَوَاحِشْ مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا وَمَا بَطَنْ وَالْإِثْمَ وَالْبَغْيَ بِغَيْرِ الْحَقِّ وَأَنْ تُشْرِكُوا بِاللَّهِ مَا لَمْ يُنَزِّلْ بِهِ سُلْطَانًا وَأَنْ تَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Say, verily, my Lord has prohibited al-fawahish, illicit and evil deeds. مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا What has become apparent, what is outer and what is seen by the people and what is hidden from the people. And the sin in general and oppression without any right. And that you make shirk with Allah ta'ala in a way that He sent down no authority. And that you speak about Him. Here's the shahid. Here's the reference point for our discussion. And that you speak about Allah with what you don't know. Speaking about Allah Azza wa Jal without knowledge is a crime in Islam. It's a serious crime in Islam. Look at this ayat and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala builds up by saying Allah has prohibited illicit deeds, what is open and what's hidden from them. And He has pr- prohibited sins in general and oppression without right. And that you make shirk on Allah Azza wa Jal. Look how we're leading up. And that you speak about Allah without knowledge. The verse ends and you speak about Allah without knowledge. Let everyone who speaks about Allah Azza wa Jal without knowledge from the book and the sunnah beware of this ayah. It's a great crime with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you speak about Him without any knowledge. So what if you were to give Allah a name and you have no text? What if you were to assign Allah Azza wa Jal a name? And that's, that's the relationship of that ayat to our bab here. What if you were to say about Allah Azza wa Jal and give Him a name that He is named with? Not that you inform us about Him. Not that you say that Allah is mawjood, مثلا. Allah is present. Present meaning the opposite of absent. Allah is mawjood, yes. Allah is al-mawjood and it's from His names. Where is your proof? have no proof. We must have a textual evidence to support each and every name that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is assigned and that we give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we refer to Him with. Uh, now, so the people who say, for example, this example I gave you, Al-Mawjood. And you find people named Abdul mawjood And you find people saying, Allah is Al-Mawjood. And they mean that that's one of His names. And even you find in some of those weak Sufi books that have the names of Allah that they want you to count in a specific way that's not from the sunnah. That you find that Al Mawjud, Al Mawjud is one of the names of Allah. Al Mawjud has no text from the book in the Sunnah. Al Mawjud has no mention from the 14, 15, 16 or so ulama that have written specific books collecting names of Allah Azza wa Jal from the book in the Sunnah, from here and there. Has no mention from any of them. Not from Sufyan ibn Uyayna, not from, uh, not from Ibn Qayyim, not from Muhammad ibn Salah al Uthaymin, not from Ibn Wazir, not from any of the ulama who wrote books. Not from Al-Bayhaqi. Not from any of them who wrote books specifically compiling the names of Allah. None of them ever mentioned the name Al-Mawjood. So the name, of, the name Al-Mawjood, we can say, we don't say it's not from the names of Allah. We don't affirm it as the name of Allah Azza wa Jal. We don't negate either without a text. We only assign or we only affirm a name for Allah Azza wa Jal when we have a text in front of us. Now, so having said that, furthermore to ascribe a name to Allah the Exalted that He did not ascribe to His own self, or to deny something that he has named himself would be a serious crime against him. So one must behave in the appropriate manner in this affair and stick to what is found in the established textual evidences only. And one last point that's kind of important, that it's, it's definitely important for our knowledge and our menhaj, for our understanding of the correctness of a salafiya, and that is that uh, this subject we're studying how to have the proper aqidah of Allah, how to believe in Allah's names and attributes. It's from the first and foremost things that the Prophet ﷺ was referring to when he said that I have only been sent to perfect good moral character. Good moral character is not about what's between you and other servants only. Good moral character starts with your behavior between yourself and your Lord, your dealings between yourself and your Lord. How is it that you understand your Lord and how is it that you view your Lord and how is it that you... Uh, how is it that you refer to your Lord? And what kind of statements do you make about your Lord, Azza wa Jal? That's the first and foremost thing that a servant should be worried about when it comes to his manners. And so you find that the Salafis, the people who ascribe to the Salafi da'wah, they are the people focusing on the affairs of the Aqidah. They are the people trying to find out about Allah, Azza wa Jal. What are his attributes? What are his names? How do I worship him properly? They are the ones trying to have good manners, first and foremost, out of any other group of people. And yet they're the ones being criticized because they have no good manners, because they don't have good manners. We say to the people of Ta'til and the people of Ta'wil and the Ikhwan al-Muslimin, the people who allow every kind of bid'ah and asma wa sifat, we say, where are your good manners between you and Allah Azza wa Jal? Why don't you have good manners between you and Allah and stop going behind the book of Allah and denying verses? Why don't you have good manners with you and Allah Azza wa Jal instead of saying, Tabarak al-ladhi bi al-mulk. Blessed is he, the one in his hand is the dominion. 
why don't you follow that ayah, that ayah and just say, I believe that Allah has a hand and have good manners with Allah Azza wa Jal. Instead of saying, no, actually Allah doesn't have a hand. And why don't you love that aqidah? And why don't you call to that aqidah? And why don't you express your good manners by way of aqidah of asma wa sifat? And we can go down the line and, and how do you worship Allah? And how do you pray? And how are your manners with Allah Azza wa Jal? Down the line. You find those people casting accusations against the Salafiyun that they have bad manners. If you look to their interaction with their Lord, they have the most horriblest and most filthiest and most disgusting manners that a person could possibly have. So from a number of angles we can refute the claim of the people of falsehood, the, the claim of the people of Hizbiyah and Bid'ah, that the Salafiyun are people of bad manners. The only thing they have to say about us is that we have bad manners, meaning that we don't smile at them or meaning that we have this or that with us. And all of the Muslims are working on their good character. And the, and the Salafis are not specific, having specific bad problems with their character. In fact, we are mayas, we are better than the rest of the people. Meaning that we are trying our very best to correct our relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal. And have good manners between ourselves and our creators. And we don't, this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he was only sent to correct or to perfect good moral character. How can it be understood as just dealings between the people only? without any reference to Allah Azza wa Jal, without any reference to good character between the servant and the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or without any reference to the uh, servant and the companions of the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How can it be understood in that way? For verily if we understand the hadith that way, and there's nothing heavier, ma min shay'in athkharu fil mizani min husn al khalaq there's nothing heavier in the scales on the day of judgment than good character. All of that's just about personal dealings between one Muslim and another. Then we have become Christians, brothers and sisters. We are Christians. We have no deen, we have no aqidah, we have no manhaj, we have no halal, no haram, no sharia, nothing. Just good manners between people. We're Christians, we might as well not have a deen at all. So now, the application of good manners in Islam is first and foremost starts between the servant and his Lord. And Allah knows best.